while you understand that uh, that music was to touch my deep emotions and also to prepare you for the revolution, <laughs> but uh, the jumbo jets are waiting at Orlando Airport to take 5,000 people from the Ligonier National Conference this year to Washington, and you'll hand in your citizenship there, <laughs> and uh, the planes will continue to the United Kingdom, and border control is waiting there to welcome you back to your formerly lawfully constituted <laughs> government. <laughs> we we do have CPAs available, and they will be calculating back taxes. Um, <laughs> but if the, if the plan succeeds, you'll be able to hear all the bagpipe music you ever wanted to hear. And uh, I want to thank Chris Larson and the staff here for arranging this uh, post-birthday treat for me. Uh, although all of you who love Highland Cathedral should know that it was composed by a German. Um, I think he was a wannabe Scottish German. But, uh. Well, our subject for this session, and it is a great joy and privilege to be sharing in the conference with dear friends, uh, to celebrate a birthday with 5,000 friends is something of a treat for someone who is a, a youngster coming to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, wondered if the great cost of becoming a Christian believer would be the loss of friends, and uh, if there is a promise of the Lord Jesus that has certainly been fulfilled in my life, it is the promise that you give up nothing for Him, but He restores it a hundredfold uh, in this life, even if there are persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. Well, our subject, as you know, is doctrine in the dark, and I want to read a couple of verses from Paul's letter to the Romans, although uh, we will by no means be focusing on Paul's teaching there, although that might seem an obvious thing to do. First of all, in Romans chapter 6, and words of great import in verse 17 and then famous words uh, with which all of us here are particularly familiar from Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 6, 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard or form of doctrine to which you were committed. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, notice this unexpected antithesis, have become obedient from the heart to the forum of doctrine to which you were committed. And then, of course, in chapter 12, which in a sense builds on that statement, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, as we turn to this theme, let us turn for a moment to the Lord and seek His blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the riches of the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, and that You have stored up in Him every spiritual blessing for Your children. We thank You that You have lavished Your love and patience upon us, and we praise You that in discovering Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, we have also discovered that He is our Creator that all things hold together in Him, and that You have opened up for us not only the affections of our hearts, but the whole world of the mind, and we have become eager to know You and to meditate upon Your Word and to grow in grace 
and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray as we turn to this theme today that You will instruct our minds by Your truth, that You will touch our hearts and affections by Your Spirit, that You will set free our wills, that we may will what You will, and that together we may grow wonderfully in grace and be prepared by Your Word to serve You into the future. This we pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Well, the subject doctrine in the dock immediately on receiving it sent some shivers of memory from the past down my spine. I particularly remember as, I suppose, a naive young minister, 23, uh, recently ordained, emerging from a culture of biblical exposition and Reformed theology, uh, finding my way into the broader evangelical world. I remember a friend uh, who knew people in the congregation where I was uh, saying to me, you know what they're saying about you, don't you? And I said uh, somewhat nervously, I have no idea what they are saying about me. He said, well, he said, you'll enjoy this, because I think he thought that I was the quintessence of youthful orthodoxy. He said, they are saying, you know, he's really helpful when it comes to practical matters, but when he gets on to doctrine, we're not really sure what it is that he is talking about. <laughs> and it was within those weeks that uh, I think probably naively, although with a good spirit, uh, one Sunday evening preached a sermon uh, from the opening verses of Ephesians chapter 1 and named the dreadful word election. And uh, at the end, uh, a young woman with whom, thankfully, uh, I think I still have a, a good relationship of friendship, marched up to me and with strong, starey eyes and an accusatory accent in her voice said, I am sure you prayed over every single word of that sermon. The subtext was, of course you didn't. It so happened I had prayed fervently about that sermon, but then she added, I'm sure you prayed over every word, but you need to know that at the end of the sermon, I find myself utterly confused. Actually, that was an occasion of great illumination for me. It helped me to understand that if Christian people are to be led into the riches of the gospel, then confusion may be their first experience. They need to be deconstructed from the things they have believed, sometimes to go through a period of confusion about what they believe before they are anchored in what the Scripture teaches them to believe. Because understanding the teaching of Scripture is not simply a matter of a few words and phrases here and there, but an entire paradigm about how we think about the gospel and how we think about God. And what sometimes I think we need most of all is for a new set of Velcro strips to be placed into our minds so that we can actually grasp the teaching of Scripture. And so, in a way, from those very early days in ministry and in many different contexts like you, when I have mentioned a big Bible word, and it has been characteristic, I think, of life that I have used Bible words rather than theological non-Bible words in teaching from the Scripture, but when one uses a big Bible word, so often the response has been and often sadly in our evangelical subculture. Doctrine 
divides. It is experience that unites. And I would be surprised if uh, it were true that most of us have not had that response to the use of one of the big words of the gospel that we have come to love as we have learned to study Scripture. And if you don't have much doctrine and you don't have much experience, it's often difficult to know what to say in response to that. But actually, at the end of the day, the true response to that is to say, have you any idea how deeply doctrinal that statement is? Have you any idea of the framework of reference that you are bringing to such a statement that expresses actually the doctrine that you hold? And then to say, and incidentally, don't you realize how divisive that statement is? Don't you realize that your argumentativeness, that your starry-eyedness does not commend to me the notion that we should abandon doctrine and sail into the great sea and ocean of a shared experience. And of course, the reason for that is simply this. It's our doctrine that shapes our experience. It's impossible to read the pages of the Scriptures without coming to understand that it's the doctrine of the Scriptures that shapes the experience of believers whose life story we are founding in the Scriptures, and that ranges from the doctrine of the sovereignty of God to the doctrine of the providence of God to the creative work of God to the redeeming work of God to the indwelling of Jesus Christ and the believers indwelling in Christ to the life of sanctification to the prospect that we will be enabled to persevere to our anticipation of glory from beginning to end, the way in which we grasp the doctrine, the teaching, the inner consistency and unity of the revelation God has given to us in the Scriptures is the central instrument God uses then to shape our lives and to mold us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very simple illustration of that's found, isn't it, in Romans 8, 29? That big word, predestination. He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And you remove the doctrine of predestination, and you undercut the glorious telos of the Christian life, that we are going to be transformed to the likeness of Christ. And this is God's set and loving purpose for our lives, so that instead of producing division of heart, what an understanding of biblical doctrine does for us in marvelous ways is to elevate our sense of the sheer, unadulterated privilege of what it means to be a child of God and to be a Christian believer. And so, this is a subject of, I think, considerable importance. And what I want us to do in our time together is essentially two things. I want us to step back from this situation and examine it from two different points of view. First of all, to raise the historical question, how did we get here that so many evangelical Christians will utter this mantra, doctrine divides, it is experience that unites? And then secondly, to think about this issue from a biblical point of view and go to one or two places almost by random in Scripture, but with some diversity, to see how it is that the doctrine of the gospel builds up the character of the Christian believer, makes him or her stable and useful in the service of God and in the life of the kingdom of God. Well, first of all, the historical question. It has not always been the case, you understand, that Christians, evangelical Christians, 
have thought so poorly of doctrine and so highly of Christian experience. Our forefathers understood these two realities to be integrated in Scripture and to be married in the life of the Christian believer. So, what is it that has happened? Well, the answer to that is actually fairly simple, although it's somewhat philosophical. Many of us who come to these conferences are familiar with that movement that took place in the thought patterns of thought leaders in Europe in the 18th into the 19th century that uh, paradoxically is called the Enlightenment, but probably should be called the Endarkening. And one of the great figures of that movement was uh, a philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who hardly ever went a mile beyond his front door. His whole world was the world of thinking and teaching what he was thinking. And one of his fascinations was with this issue. What are the limits of human understanding? How does the mind function in relationship to external reality? Those of you who have some familiarity with Kant's thought, if you've taken a philosophy course or a culture course somewhere or another, you would have this familiarity. Kant came to the conclusion that the powers of the human mind were limited to the phenomenal realm. And so, the human mind was limited in its capacity to what is, as it were, visible and tangible. It's not able to penetrate beyond the visible to any invisible reality. Or to use the technical language that the philosophers liked to throw around, the mind of man is limited to grasping the phenomenal realm, but cannot penetrate to the noumenal realm. The moment the human mind seeks to penetrate to the noumenal realm, its ability fragments and fractures, and nothing is clear. And so, if you are going to believe in God, and the philosophers, the, the historians of philosophy still discuss what was Kant's personal religious life really like, then Kant would say, the one thing we have in common is a universal sense of obligation. And that universal sense of obligation that we all feel argues, logically argues to the conclusion there is a universal obligator, and that universal obligator is God. We may not know Him, we may not have what Christians call fellowship with Him or really love Him, but He is a universal obligator. This is the reason why we all have this sense, this common sense. Sometimes the waters are muddied, but everyone has a basic sense. Even the postmodern, the most radical postmodern individual will not let you do anything to him on the basis that anything goes morally. And that therefore we can argue from the existence of this universal sense of obligation to religion and the universal obligator. And of course, it opened the door for the despising of the Christian gospel. The idea that you can know God and live in harmony with God. The idea you can be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ all of those notions, the idea of God breaking through into this world disappears in a moment of philosophical supposed enlightenment. And then here is the issue, really. It was in response to that that the German philosopher, theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher wrote his famous book, Speeches to the Cultured Despisers of religion. Here we are, and we are in the great universities of Europe, and we are enlightenment men and women, and we despise the Christian faith. It is passé. 
And Schleiermacher comes along, as many of you know, and he says, no, no, he says, you've completely misunderstood the reality of the situation. True religion, true Christianity does not lie first and foremost in a series of doctrinal propositions, but in a deep sense of dependence upon God that we have. And sometimes that sense of dependence on God seeks to become independent of God, and that's what we call sin. And of course, the great illustration of absolute dependence on God is Jesus of Nazareth lived His life out of this sense of absolute dependence upon God, and you can see that His deep sense of this. That's true religion. Just by way of parenthesis, Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian, believed that Friedrich Schleiermacher was nevertheless in his heart a true Christian believer. But at least in my own view, what Friedrich Schleiermacher did has proven to be utterly disastrous to the Christian church and not least the evangelical Christian church because it was a very simple move, wasn't it? You stop thinking about doctrine, and what you do is you look inwards and you examine experience. If you've ever traced what has happened in most of the great universities in the United States of America, you would see Schleiermacher's influence coming home to roost. What do I mean by that? All of those great universities used to have faculties of divinity or faculties of theology. If you go to those universities nowadays, almost without exception, the names of those faculties have been changed from faculties of theology and divinity to faculties of religion where the object of study is no longer conceivably the knowledge of a God who has revealed Himself in creation and in providence and in redemptive history and in Jesus Christ and by the power of His Holy Spirit bringing us to faith. No, what we examine here is people's subjective religious experience, and at the end of the day, that's what unites us, isn't it? And so, whether we are Muslims or Jews or Confucianists or Buddhists or Christians or what have you, we are all in there in the department of religious studies because man's chief object of study at the end of the day turns out to be man himself. And yes, of course, there is a kind of evolution that some of us might happen to believe in, that Christianity is higher, that Jesus is higher than Buddha, that Jesus is higher than Socrates. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing, but we're looking at it simply in terms of some kind of evolution towards human improvement. And uh, what's missing in all this? Actually, what's missing in all this is God. What's missing in all this is the fundamental principle with which the Bible opens, that God has created all things, and that in everything He has created, He has revealed Himself, as Paul underlines in Romans 1, as a creating, revealing, eternal, glorious, and righteous God. And it's all there plainly before us for our eyes to see. The problem is not in the clarity of the revelation. The problem is in the darkness of the human mind. But not only the doctrine of God as the revealer, but uh, that same opening chapter of the Bible teaches us that this revealing God has made man as His image and in His likeness for the very purpose that there might be in man, man and woman, a receptivity, an ability to grasp the revelation of God, to walk in fellowship with God, to know God. 
Now, you see what happens when this teaching about man being made as the image of God disappears as it's disappeared, hasn't it, in Western civilization and Western philosophical thinking, in the plain man's thinking? What happens when you get rid of the notion that man is made as the image of God? Do you exalt man? Does the humanist exalt man? No, what the humanist does is abort babies and prefers whales to human beings and believes in euthanasia and believes there are no significant gender differences to speak of, and therefore is in the process of demeaning and destroying man, far less simply destroying the glory of God. I often say to people, you know, we are so ignorant of our history that secularists, humanists, they believe, yes, you know, Jesus taught some nice things. If we can just get rid of this notion of the particularity of the Christian faith, we'll all get back to being the nice civilized people we used to be, and they don't know enough about history to know that before the gospel came, we were pagans. And when the gospel goes, the only thing left is to worship ourselves, or the whales, or the stars, or human progress. But we are on the high road to self-destruction because we are denying and repudiating the most fundamental thing about our being, that we have been created by this loving Heavenly Father, and He has made us as His image bearers. And that's simply to say, that's simply to say, and this is just one of many Christian doctrines, if you think that doctrine divides Christians, but experience unites them, you're going to end up on the same tragic road where you are unable to distinguish one experience from another. And the amazing thing, really, when you think about it, when you, when you think about the past and where we are today in the evangelical subculture, the amazing thing is that the place where Friedrich Schleiermacher's views seem to be most alive and well is on what passes for evangelical television and radio and popular communication, where the really important thing, of course, is the experience that we have. And you see it in all kinds of subtle ways, don't you? You see it in, the, in, the, in some of the worship that emerges in uh, professing Christian churches today, where so much of the praise is about me. Now, I think we, especially we Reformed people, need to be very careful about what we say about worship. If you look through the Psalms, there are some of the Psalms that have too many I's and me's in them for the liking of some Reformed people. Not every psalm speaks directly to God. There are a lot of psalms that speak horizontally to the congregation. But there's a balance. There's an understanding. My salvation doesn't lie in my spiritual experience, but in the death and resurrection and ascension and heavenly session and reign and coming again of the Lord Jesus. And therefore, I need to know Him and my praise needs to be full of Him. remember on one occasion I was in a situation of a, a burgeoning young church, and a young man bounced up to me. Now that I've had that birthday, I'm able to speak about young men <laughs> bouncing up to me. And uh, he said, I'm the, I'm the worship leader around here. Now, anyone says that to me, there's a bubble above my head that says, Sonny boy, Jesus Christ is the worship leader around here. You may be the choir director. 
Now, this is not another State of the Union address. Remember, Alistair's word, you're taking up my time here. And uh, I said, well, what are you going to be leading in tomorrow? Well, he said, we've written a couple of things ourselves. And then he said, there's another one we're singing. He says, I wonder, guys, you, I don't know if you would know it. I think it was, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? And I thought, you don't know enough about anything to understand. That's the one thing you're singing tomorrow that's got any real gospel in it. And we see it in our preaching. Um, I've come to speak about preaching that uses the find Waldo method of preaching. Um, and I've experienced it. You, the, the preacher is preaching through a gospel, and the hermeneutical question he's always asking is this, where are you in this passage? Now, friends, the answer is you're not in that passage at all. <laughs> not unless you're almost 2,000 years old, you are not in that passage. And if you are, then they'll give you a discount on the way out for being at the, Ligon, the oldest attender at the Ligonier Conference. We do not read the Gospels to answer the question, who am I? That question will be answered in due course. We need the Gospels to answer the question, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? You see? And it's Schleiermacher. It's Schleiermacher trying to find Waldo, isn't it? Where is my experience here? Now, of course, please do not misunderstand. Most of you who know me would not misunderstand me. I'm far from saying that experience is unimportant. I want to highlight experience, but gospel-driven experience, not experience that's driven out of the trivialities of my own life, but experience that's shaped by the truth and the power of the gospel that really transforms people's lives. And perhaps the place where we see this most frequently is in our prayer, isn't it? God is not to be treated as the great majestic God of the universe. God's actually like me. So, I speak to Him the way I would speak to one of my pals. And you see, this is what it does to experience. It shrinks experience. R.C. referred to that conflict between Erasmus of Rotterdam and Luther uh, yesterday in, incidentally, a superb illustration of teaching Christian doctrine. Uh, but you remember what Luther wrote to Erasmus. Erasmus, here's your problem. Your God is too manlike. Your God is too manlike. And well, that's where we end up, isn't it? Um, we reduce God to be like ourselves. So, that's something of our history and the tragedy, as I say, of our lives is that uh, so many Christian people know so little about the history of the church that they think today, what we're doing today is normal, and they therefore assume. I've had people come to me about things that we've done in services and somewhat irritated say, I like the traditional way. And I've said, but that is the traditional way. What you think is the traditional way is the way of the last 30 years. That's why it's so valuable for us to have some sense of the flow of things in order that we may have a stable view of the value of Christian doctrine, understand the blessings it's brought to the Christian church, and how at the end of the day naive it is to say that the real problem is doctrine and our great salvation lies in experience. No, the salvation of our experience lies in our grasp of the doctrine. Now, let me turn to the second main point and think about this now, not from the historical point of view, but think about it just a little from the biblical point of view to give you some illustrations 
chosen almost at random, except that I've chosen illustrations from Moses, from David, from Jesus, from Paul, and chosen illustrations from different periods of redemptive history and different genre of literature in the Scriptures that underscore for us that the biblical perspective is that it's the doctrine of the gospel that actually develops the experience of the Christian believer, transforms it, and makes our experience like the experience of those who know their God. Now, I say there's almost random illustrations, first of all, from the days of Moses. The Ten Commandments, they deal with experience, don't they? Aren't they all about experience, about practical, spiritual living? Uh, but you see, you misunderstand the Ten Commandments unless you read the words that introduce them. You need to know who God is if you're going to make sense of this in your life and to be energized into it in your life. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. There's so much just in that statement. There's His great redemptive work. There's His covenant character by which He binds Himself to His people. There is the logic of the gospel. It is because of who I am and what I am that you are called to live in this way, that these commandments are not simply a bunch of random thoughts that I have heard that you might like or you might find difficult. This is my calling of my redeemed people to be the humanity that I created you to be, but from which you have fallen since the days of Adam. What I'm doing here is putting on display in your ghastly pagan society what it means for men and women as a community to live to the glory of God and reflect the very character of God so that the pagans around you, no matter how much they may hate the particularity of what I've done in you, will not be able to withstand the thought, this is life as it was ever meant to be lived. And it's so fascinating, he even includes in it the use of the Sabbath day, doesn't he? Why? Because God is the great legalist in the sky? No, because He wants His people to live within the rhythm of working and resting that will make them stand out from every other community round about them. Doctrine transforms experience. Take a second illustration, perhaps not quite such a well-known passage, but from the 102nd Psalm marvelous psalm with the title, A Prayer of One Afflicted When He Is Faint and Pours Out His Complaint Before the Lord. Perhaps you're at this conference, and actually this is your experience. This is a template of your experience. He's, he's crying out to God. He feels God is distant. Don't hide your face from me. He's deeply depressed. My days pass away like smoke. My bones burn like a furnace. I forget to eat my bread. He's gone off his food. I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness. I lie awake. He's, uh, he's having trouble getting back to sleep. I'm like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. And, and the enemies, it all seems so exaggerated now, doesn't he? All the day my enemies taunt me. Is that really true? not better things to do with the time, 24-7 taunting him. But it feels like that, surely, to him. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. I eat ashes like bread. He lifts up his cup of coffee, and the tears flow into the coffee. And uh, he begins to have a twisted view of God. Now, we've all a twisted view of God by nature. I say to people, if a non-Christian says to you, the God I believe in is a God of love, find a gracious way of saying to them, you are lying through your teeth. 
Everything about you breathes a spirit of someone who utterly mistrusts God. And this man is brought to the position where he says to the covenant faithful God, you have lifted me up and then you've thrown me away. You've discarded me like a child who's lost interest in a recent toy. And you see his doctrine of God has become distorted. What's the solution? What's the remedy? What's the divine pharmaceutical? Well, he tells us in verse 12, but you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. What's the solution? It's the knowledge of the absolute sovereignty of God. It's the knowledge of the sheer eternity of God. Oh, that word eternity. He is the eternal God. It's the knowledge of the gracious, fatherly pity and compassion of the Lord. And you see what's happening. His eyes have been lifted up. You remember how the psalmist says much earlier on, God became my glory and the lifter up of my head. It's as though the Spirit has put His hand under His chin and said to Him, now, child, lift up your head and gaze upon the glory of God, and that will transform everything for you. And he goes on in the psalm, and of course he falls back. Of course, the graph is not a straight-line trajectory to heaven on flowery beds of ease. But there is a trajectory that keeps going. So, at the end of the day, this man who could hardly see the night through actually ends the psalm by saying, the children of your servants shall dwell secure, and their offspring shall be established before. It's amazing. This man who can't see past his nose is now seeing past his grandchildren because he's got caught up in understanding it's what I know about God that shapes my personal experience and transforms me in this world that often is so full of darkness and despair. So, not only from the heart of God's covenant with Moses, but from the heart of Old Testament spirituality. Remember how Calvin says about the Psalms, the Psalms contain an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. And you see, if you're going to be a spiritual pharmacist or physician, you need to know your anatomy, don't you? You need to know what goes wrong and you also, as when I was a boy, you went to the pharmacist and these all these old bottles there, these wise old men, Mr. McCutcheon, the pharmacist who knew the mysteries of these bottles, would go to the bottle. And because he understood, with the help of the physician, what was going wrong in the anatomy, he was able to bring the pharmaceutical to bear, to bring healing to the sickness. Of course, he didn't have a jar that said Tamiflu, <laughs> or he would have been a millionaire. <laughs> but you see, he was able to go to the jar, and if you were a sickly little boy, he would say, I'll just make something up for the laddie, and the laddie would be strengthened. Now, you need to be able to do this. And it's the knowledge of Christian doctrine, biblical doctrine, that enables us to do this. Well, let me turn to a third illustration, the simple words of Jesus. That's what we need. We need the simple words of Jesus. Ah, yes, the simple words of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount. I love the Sermon on the Mount. Have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Do you know how the Sermon on the Mount finishes? I can't get, can't get into all this stuff about Jesus being a Savior, but I love the Sermon on the Mount. Did you read to the back of the book? Do you see what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? But what's Jesus doing in the Sermon on the Mount? Actually, it's profoundly doctrinal. He's beginning by saying in the Beatitudes, this is who you are in my kingdom. 
And He takes all of those Old Testament Scriptures, and He brings them to bear on this new community that He's creating. He says, the very first thing you need to know, the, the Beatitudes are not commands telling us what we need to be. That would be to misread them. They're a description of what we are and why we are blessed with all of God's covenant blessings. And he's saying it's because you understand who you are that you will know your place in God's economy and how it is that the law that drives you to faith in me because you know you can't keep it is the very teaching of God that will help you to live for me because the Spirit will enable you to keep it. And here you are, you don't know what to say. Well, pray like this, our Father. Every single statement in the Lord's prayer is weighted with the profoundest Christian doctrine. And here I am, and I'm tempted to be hypocritical because I know I'm not meeting the mark. Or alternatively, I'm tempted to be very anxious and nervous because I don't know what's going to happen to my life. Uh, says Jesus, I need to teach you the doctrine of the fatherhood of God. If I teach you the doctrine of the fatherhood of God, then you'll know you don't need to pretend. If the one who knows you through and through embraces you as your heavenly Father, and dear child, you'll not need to be anxious, because the Father who has created the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, He will give you everything that you need. Or the farewell discourse, what do you say to people when you know you're going to die in the next 24 hours? Well, you read through, we don't have time to do this, you read through Jesus farewell discourse in John 13 through 17, and the answer is, you teach people about the doctrine of the Trinity. You teach them the deepest mysteries you can find, because that's what's going to anchor their soul. I am in the Father. My Father is in me. You are united to me. I dwell in you. The Spirit will open your eyes. Wow! Or if you want to turn Moses, David, Jesus, the Apostle Paul. You know, one of the sorest experiences I've had in the United States, uh, sometime in the 1980s, I was speaking at a multi-state student conference of an organization for which I had some respect and still indeed do. They asked me to speak on knowing Christ. They said, you have four addresses. Tell us about knowing Christ. And after the first two addresses, I was taken into a semi-darkened room by the staff and given a not-too-polite doing over, very accusatory. I've never forgotten the accusation. It was this, you have spoken to us now for two solid hours, and you have not told us one thing we need to do. And I said, I thought you asked me to speak about knowing Christ. You don't know Christ by all the things you're able to do. You know Christ when the fullness of His grace is exhibited before you in the proclamation of the gospel, and you find yourself embraced by and embracing Him and then I said, and uh, I am by nature a very shy and reserved person, I said, if you've given me two hours and I've said nothing about what you are to do, you need to wait for the next two hours because you are going to find Jesus Christ telling you many things that you do not want to do. Think about Paul, actually. The text was Paul in Philippians 3, I want to know him. Does that mean I empty my mind? No, it means I read Philippians 2, 5 to 11, doesn't it? That though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality of God something 
that uh, he needed to grasp onto, make himself a special consideration, but he emptied himself, became a servant, took on the form of a man, humbled himself even to death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What is that if it's not Christian, glorious, mind-stretching, heart-warming, affection-transforming, life-changing, Christian doctrine, teaching about Christ. And if all you're interested in is finding Waldo, then go and buy the book and find Waldo. But if your life is longing for a real transformation, then you need to understand and have your mind filled with Christ. A word or two by way of application of a minute or two, Chris, uh, just to say one or two things. There's so much more to say. First of all, a word to pastors and leaders. We need to give our people these Velcro strips in their minds, or they'll not be able to take in our exposition. Systematic expository preaching is not what the Reformers did. What the Reformers did was systematic expository preaching plus catechizing. And however we do it, there are many different ways of doing it. We don't need to go to the shorter catechism. There are many ways of doing it. If we are pastors and leaders, we need to have these two approaches to teaching the gospel because when we do that, the Velcro strips that are provided by bringing out the doctrine of Scripture provides people with places where they can more and more absorb the doctrine of Scripture. I think about a lady who said to me, dear supportive lady who said to me on one occasion, I've listened to that message you gave on X five times or seven times, whatever it was. Every time I hear it, I learn something new. Well, the message wasn't that complicated. And I thought to myself, my dear, if somebody had just taught you a basic catechism, you could have picked all that up in two listenings. The problem was not the complexity of the truth being communicated. The problem was there was nowhere for the truth to stick. That's why Calvin says, the church that does not catechize, and he doesn't mean that in a narrow sense, but the church that doesn't teach doctrine as well as expounding Scripture is not going to last. It's not going to have the muscle. It's not going to have the sinews. Second thing to say to all of us who are here as a people, we want this. Do we not want this? But we need to be very careful that we are clear what we want, that we want our pastors and our teachers to do this. Hey, you heard a superb exposition of Christian doctrine from R.C. at the beginning of the conference, and you may think to yourself, if only R.C. were in our church, it would be very different. Um, that's not God's plan. So, do not go away superimposing onto your own pastor a standard, a mold into which your own pastor will not fit but make sure you encourage him in this way. Is there any encouragement to those of you who are pastors? R.C. gave our church the enormous privilege a year ago around this time of coming to do our annual conference, and my colleague Derek Thomas, whom many of you know and have read, two of us supposed to be professors of systematic theology in different theological seminaries. Somebody left the church, shook uh, my colleague Derek Thomas's hand and said, it's about time we were getting some theology in this church. Wow. <laughs> there aren't many of us who can get away with using the words initium, fundamentum, and radix. <laughs> so, this is about our church. 
the gifts God has given to us. A word to those of you who are younger. One of the great privileges of my life when I was 18, I was sitting in a meeting at which the late Professor John Murray was speaking. And it was as though Professor Murray came up to the seat in which I was sitting and said, son, I want, you to, show, show, I want to show you something. We were meeting in an ancient paneled room in an ancient Scottish university. And it was though he took me to the wall and he said, you may not have noticed, but one of these panels has a handle on it. It's not a handle, it's a door. And I'm going to open that door. And the moment we step through that door, you are going to discover that there are riches of Christian doctrine taught in Scripture way beyond what anyone has ever suggested to you. I guess you can hear Professor Murray somewhere on the web. You need to find a place. It may be a book. It may be a person. Please, God, it will be your own minister who will take you by the hand and lead you through the panel door, and there you will discover in Christian doctrine an entire world that will bring most glorious, glorious blessing to you. So, doctrine transforms experience. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the riches of the gospel again and for the way in which in every hand in Your Word it teaches us Christ, makes us more like Christ, leads us to glorify Christ. So, we thank You for Your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen.